offerings being taken, I want to just set this um, message up. We have a very important uh, topic that we're going to look at today. It's central to the Bible story, and it's central to our lives and into our future. We've been walking through this series we called uh, Promise, um, a power. And we're going to talk, today we're going to talk about the power of promise. We've been looking at the life of David, and today we're going to look at uh, a very important theme that runs throughout all of biblical history and again into the future. And I want to set it up by asking this question. So we think about promises today and the promises of God ultimately. Have you ever had someone, now this could get real tender, I know if we really think and dig deep here. Have you ever had uh, someone make a promise to you and then they, they didn't keep their promise? Have, have you ever been maybe involved in a, gosh, on a more practical level, uh, maybe a, a contract disagreement or something, maybe uh, in your work or maybe at your house or apartment, you, you had a contract with someone or maybe it was with some provider or something, they broke their contract or so you thought, or maybe you broke the contract, maybe you're an attorney here and you're like, I live in this world all the time, this is what I do, right? We are a litigious people in America, uh, but, but I wonder if you've ever been involved in a promise that was unkept. How about this? Have you ever made a promise that you did not keep? Have you ever done that? I think all of us in varying degrees have done that because we make promises all the time. It might be as simple as, hey, I'm going to meet you for lunch or I'll be there at that time or you promised your kid you're going to do this or that. We've all breached a promise or some kind of contract along the way. Well, today we're going to talk again about the, the, the power of promise. In the Bible, uh, we see a series of promises that God made to his people, which play out even into our lives today as we look at redemptive history. And in, in the Bible, these promises are called covenants. And today we're going to look at one specifically. It's called the Davidic covenant, uh, David's covenant, if you will. And so before we jump into this and open the scripture, I want us to get our minds around the covenants of God. So we're going to uh, let the guys from the Bible Project, many of us are reading through the Bible this year. Many of you are. You can jump in, join us. Uh, every week you can see where we are. You can go online and find it. Uh, go find the app and join us and continue to read now the scriptures through from this point on. We'd love for you to do that. Um, but let's look at John and Tim. They're going to help us out, the guys from the Bible Project, on what it is that God has done through these covenants and what they all mean. And then we're going to see where the Davidic covenant lands. So watch the screen. If you've been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, or your father, or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much, and that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right, and this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel and obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. 
they worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure, somehow. Yeah, they called it the New Covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus, is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who was able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David. And so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human, but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who are becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. All right, so hey, I want you to grab your Bible and turn to 2 Samuel. We're going to continue, again, to look at the life of David. Um, Now, last week, if you were here, we talked about David and Bathsheba, this misuse of power. And we talked about uh, how God allows us, helps us to live pure lives in this sexualized culture we live in, broken world that we live in. Now, where we're going now, uh, just to give you a little chronological order, we actually are stepping back in time just a bit. But this is on purpose because we wanted to land this whole series with the Davidic covenant because it does, as you see, launch us into the rest of the biblical story. So turn to 2 Samuel 7. And I'll put this into context. Nathan, you might remember his name. He's the prophet, okay, who's come alongside David during his reign. He's the king in Judah, the southern kingdom. Nathan's the prophet who walks alongside King David. He's become his guide, his spiritual uh, guidance along the way. And he's praying and guiding and leading. He'll rebuke David. He'll guide him along the way. But here it is in verse 1 and 2. Look at this. We're going to look at this whole chapter. Now, when the king lived in his house... And the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies, so there's no war going on. There was. They're kind of constantly at war with people around him, the Philistines in particular and others. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, so this is David, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. So you remember, we're just now, we're out of the wilderness, you know, the story of coming out of uh, the Exodus, and now they're way past that. But God's temple has not yet been built. Now, it will be built, some of you know, by Solomon, who's David's son. But here, David says, hey, what's the deal? I'm living in this beautiful house of cedar. I'm living in this palace. And God has no house at all. He wants to build him a house. He's so obsessed with this idea, in fact, that you can see in Psalm 132, verse 4 and 5. It says, I will not sleep. I will not give sleep. He writes a song about it. To my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So this is a noble venture that uh, David says, man, we got to build him a house. But then God reminds him in the following verses there, He reminds him, in actually verse 4 and 5, he reminds David, hey, at no point have I asked any leader to build me a house, right? Uh, This is important to note that the word uh, house in the Hebrew, this is important for our message today, the word house, bayit in in the Hebrew, can mean an ordinary house, okay? It can also mean a temple, like the house of God, and can also mean a dynasty, okay? Like now we have, you know, in British terms, we have the house of Windsor, okay? The reigning, you know, monarch. So it it can mean this, this lineage or family. God goes on to say, David, listen, I want you, look at verse seven, I just want you to shepherd my people, okay? I want you to just guide and lead as a king. You shepherd my people, not build me a house. In fact, uh, he, could, he could be saying here, temples are for deities that are tied down, stuck in one place. That's not me. 
And so what I want to do here as we unpack this very important, we're going to dig deep. We're going to go deep into some theological truth here today, but we're going to see how it applies to all of us. All right. So y'all ready for this? But don't you think in caps, because what I want to do is talk about the purpose all right, of the covenant. I want to talk about the paradox of the covenant. I want to talk about the power of the covenant. Then I want to talk about the person of the covenant. All right. So if you take notes, it's that simple. First, let's talk about the purpose of the covenant. God's making a covenant here with David in this chapter. We see it and look at where it goes here in verse nine. So he, he goes on to say, hey, I um, here's what I'm going to do. I, I, yeah, I don't have a tent. You're right. We've been moving around in tents and such. Nathan tells him actually in verse before all this, before in verse three, he says, hey, go ahead and do uh, do what's in your heart. Now, this is not a real prophetic word. He's just saying you press on and God is with you. May the Lord be with you. You go. Let's see what happens here. And so then that night he has dream, does Nathan. And he comes and the Lord tells him, hey, you go tell him that uh, I don't need a house to dwell in. All right. And then it comes on down to verse, uh, verse 9, 2 Samuel 7, verse 9. It says, And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies before you. And I will make your name great, like the name of the great ones on the earth. Now, some of you, if you know the Bible at all, this sounds a lot like Abrahamic covenant language, where he said to Abraham, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your name great. And this is where we see this in uh, Genesis 12, where it says, I'm going to make you a great one. What I want you to see, first of all, is that God uses personal pronouns here. Personal possessive pronouns, verse 7, my people, verse 10, my people, Israel. We're going to see later on, as we get down to verse 14, he's going to talk about my son. Uh, I will be a father to him. He'll be a son. So the first thing I want you to see here is that uh, the language of covenant, covenant language is the language of love. All right. It, it is the language of love, but it's also, we're going to see this weird mix. It's also the language of law. Okay. So here's what I want to do. I want you to understand the difference between contracts and covenants. This is critical. So I'm going to kind of lay a foundation before we can dive in and really understand what's going on here. Um, because it has this language of love, covenant language. It also has this language of contracts. There are terms and conditions before God and expectations and penalties. Okay. So here, here's the difference. Look at this. Contracts say something like this. A contract would say, I will be what I should be. As long as you are what you should be, right? If you're not, I'm out, right? A covenant would say this. And, and by the way, when, when we see contracts talk about this, it's why we have 1.5 million lawyers in America, okay? Um, in fact, 80% of all attorneys on the planet are in America. Again, we are a litigious, happy people. Uh, and, and this is why we have these contracts, though. But look at this. A covenant will blow your mind when you start to think about this. I will be what I should be, whether you are who you should be or not. A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties, and I'm going to come through for you whether you hold your end of the bargain or not. That's how this goes. We don't know a lot about covenants in our day, but look at this. So then a contract is about legalism and leverage. Okay, A legal agreement with my best interest in mind, in fact, is why you sign a contract. We've all done this. A covenant is about love and loyalty. All right, so this is what God does, as you're going to see. So another way to say it, a contract has loopholes. All right, again, it's why there are 15 million civil cases filed in America every year, keeping a lot of our attorneys in, in, you know, employed. Um, and, and then a covenant, though, is binding. All right. Uh, contract has loopholes. We can try to get out. Maybe you've been involved in some of your company's been involved in some kind of contractual disagreement. You've had to, you've had to litigate. You've had to go to court. But a covenant is binding. It's a close. Now, the closest thing, if you're tracking with me here, the closest thing we have to biblical covenant is what in our day? Marriage. Biblical marriage. Not all marriage. Not all marriages. Okay. We've sought to redefine marriage. But biblical marriage is a covenant agreement. A biblical marriage is, watch this, a binding covenant between two people who come into this relationship and say, I am entering into this, okay, did, did wedding not long ago, where there's, there, here we are, groom, bride, they're saying to each other, I'm in this for you, not for myself. 
I'm entering into this covenant, and I want what's best for you, not what's best for me. Now, those of us who, who are married know how difficult this is to actually live out, that kind of covenant. But this is covenant marriage. I'm in this for you no matter what. No matter what you do, I'm in. And we don't often even think of Christian marriage this way. And many have, have, have kind of redefined even Christian marriage to become a contractual kind of agreement. And it's not that at all. You can see how radical a covenant is. A lot of us think that you know, the enemy to biblical marriage is same-sex marriage. Listen, the enemy to Christian marriage, biblical marriage, is divorce. That's the enemy. And the moment I say that, I know in a crowd this size, we, you know, we have some of us who've been divorced, have walked through that challenge. And I want to say this real clearly here. God loves you. He hates divorce. He says that clearly in Deuteronomy. But he loves divorced people, as do we. Okay? You're not a second-class citizen or something. But you know why God hates divorce, if you've walked through divorce. Because of how, uh, how, how painful it can be. And how about this? How heart, You're starting to catch this. How heartbreaking... It is when someone breaks a covenant. You said you're in this forever, and you're breaking this covenant. And some of you might remember, it was 2014, so a few years ago, Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin, singer of Coldplay, they entered into divorce, calling it a conscious uncoupling. You remember this? A conscious uncoupling. I don't know. Up against an unconscious uncoupling. I don't know what that is. But they called it a conscious uncoupling. And they were trying to then redefine uh, divorce. Like, you know, we've just consciously decided that we're going to uncouple. But you listen, when you start to change language of things that really matter, like marriage, and you start to redefine what biblical marriage is, and then, then the government or whoever else puts their own term and definition on it, that starts to really impact a society. And it has impacted ours in big ways. And so if we're not careful as Christians, we start to go that track and we start to go down this slippery slope and then our marriages start to look like the rest of the world. And I'm convinced that, that a biblical marriage is one of the most profound testimonies in our day. A covenant marriage between a man and a woman. But I want to say this to our single people as well. To live in covenant with God as a single adult in our day I will not give myself to anyone else but God alone. That is a radical way to live. And so when we talk about covenant, this is why this is so important. And it's why divorce among believers in a covenant relationship is so rare. Biblical marriage uh, rarely leads to divorce. Only in extreme cases. In extreme cases, the Bible would say that you know, an unrepented, uh, unrepentant uh, infidelity or abuse but with a biblical marriage, divorce is very rare. And after every effort to reconcile, even if one member of the covenant says, I am out, the other stays faithful. And so what we want to do here in our church, and a lot of you know this, but if you're a guest, um, we want you to know that we are committed to biblical marriage and covenantal marriage. So much so, we want to save every marriage from divorce. Uh, we want to save every marriage from divorce before it begins. And so we have a newlywed class, some of you know, a newlywed ministry that we have. Um, we also, ha and that's starting up, by the way, um, in, in, in uh, June 7th and 9th. You can jump in still. We have a kind of weekend intensive. It goes in the fall and in the spring, a longer uh, course there. We train up young couples. We have a newlywed class, in fact, of a whole year of your first year of marriage. I mean, it's down in lower level Collins. Call our office about all this. We've got then a marriage corps which is a ministry to help marriages, all marriages get better. We say it's to make good marriages great. And if you're challenged in marriage, it's, it's for you to come and you can walk through that. It's, a, it's a, a really incredible course and it happens in the fall. It's starting up again. You can call David Huey, call our offices and, uh, and, and to get involved. We want to help you live out this covenant agreement. I say all this because covenant, we don't see this in our culture much, but we do see it in this rare thing called biblical marriage. Even the world has now redefined marriage as something else. So a covenant is a relationship built on a stunning blend of law and love, of truth and grace. It's loving and legal through, through voluntary vows that people enter into. Say, I am in this forever and a good day for you if you're married to say to your spouse again, I am in. I am not going anywhere. And parents, the greatest thing you can do for your children 
is to love your spouse and give them this secure and safe environment within which to flourish and to grow. And we want to help you create that kind of environment in your home. So you can see already why a covenant is so risky. It is terrifying to enter into a covenant. I remember on my wedding day, I was like, this is for real. You know, it is terrifying to say, man, I am making a commitment for the rest of my life. And, and, and we enter into it with fear and trembling. So you can see why when it's broken, there is, there's possibility for great heartache, even exploitation or abuse. When one says, I am out. And many people do this on a spiritual level. I hear a lot nowadays, it's popular to say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And what most people mean by that is, I want a contractual uh, relationship with God, not a covenant relationship. Because covenant happens in community. Again, it's why we do a wedding in front of people. Because we're doing this in front of God, our family, our friends, everybody. And in the same way, we live out the covenant in the body of Christ. It's so important. When we enter into this, we do it together. So today, what I want you to do is to struggle through uh, this, this mix of law and love, truth and grace, accountability and freedom. We don't really know how to do that too well, but let's keep pressing on. I want you to see now the paradox. Okay, now that we understand what a covenant is, let's look at, at the paradox of the covenant. I want you to wrestle with this in your mind. This is not as clear as you might think. Verses 9 and 11 says this, And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make your name great. So we said that earlier, like the name uh, of the great ones on earth. And then he goes on. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly for the time that I appointed judges from the time I appointed judges over my people, Israel. So what's he doing here? If some of y'all are jumping to right, even now, Israel is still being right from the uh, from all around Israel as a people and a place, they're being attacked. You're like, man, there's, they still don't have peace. Well, God is speaking of a time that's to come. Yes, even, even uh, there's a dual meaning here. What's going to come for them, they're not in, in their, their peaceful place. And he's going to say there's coming peace, but he's also talking about a coming day. Now watch this. God recalls his covenant with Israel. He's backing up. Uh, this is now Judah, but with the people Israel. And he says, listen, uh, we see this tension all through Scripture. All throughout history, God makes a covenant agreement with his people, as you saw in the video earlier. But his people continue to break the covenant. And he's saying, I am going to hold up my end of the bargain. All right? There are terms and and, and conditions with the covenant. It's not, it's not just that, hey, you know, have at it, whatever. I'll keep my end of this deal. Y'all, just whatever you want to do. If there are no terms or conditions, or watch this, penalties, that's not, a, that's not a covenant. That's not even a contract. And it's certainly not a covenant. So there are terms and conditions, all right? So don't think that these, his covenant with us is without condition, all right? So throughout our reading, even, if you're reading through the Bible now, we've been in the minor prophets this week. In fact, we busted through Amos and, and who? Naum and and Micah, and we started Job today, but we looked at Zephaniah, and there is graphic language through all of the minor prophets where it says, I mean, God basically says, if you do not keep my covenant with you, I will cast you aside, right? Or if you do not hold up your end of the bargain, then I'm done with you. You're out. I'll find me some, some, I'll find me somebody else. I will bring destruction on you. Judah, you, have, you don't have any idea what's coming. I mean, the stuff in Zephaniah is like, it, it's stuff of entrails and such, and he's going to do, I mean, it's just crazy stuff. If you read it and go, oh my gosh, he's going to bring this kind of punishment upon the people. And when God says that, he's not messing around. He keeps his promises. And so you read this, and there's a tension within the scriptures. And it's constant. It goes on, these two opposing realities. God loves us, and he's a covenant keeper, We do not keep our side of the covenant. What is he to do? He's in a dilemma, right? And a personal note, we all do this. We've all done this in our personal lives. I want you to think back on a time when you said, Lord, I promise. Maybe you found yourself in a really difficult spot. And I know I've done this. Lord, now this time, if you'll get me out of this, I I know I'll never do this again. 
Lord, I, I've fallen into this sin. I know it's horrible and I've been caught and now I, I will never do that again. Or if, if you'll just save me from being caught, I want to keep staying in the dark. And if I, I, Lord, I please, I promise I'll never do We do this with our kids. Lord, I, I'm going to do this and please, if my, my child could only be, oh Lord, please, and I promise I'll do that. We all do this. And about a day goes by and we break our covenant agreement that we've made with him. So you see, this gets very personal. We can get out of the theological clouds and we can find ourselves in the story here. We all do this. So here's the key question I want, I want you to wrestle with. The key question is this. Are the blessings of God conditional or are they unconditional? Is God going to bless you regardless of whatever you do? He's going to bless you. Which is it? And the moment I ask that question, I know this is true. As a pastor, I've seen this through the years. Half of us in here, we lean towards, uh, it's conditional, man. No, I mean, he's got a grace and love, but you can't just live any way you want. And then half of us are like, no, no, he's, oh, he's so gracious. We fail all the time, and he's going to love us regardless. He's just that kind of love. I'm just, I mean, I just want to climb up in his lap right now. I'm thinking about it. I just want him to love on me. And we go one way or the other. We go law or grace. Everybody in here. We lean toward truth or we lean toward grace. And these two extremes, you see, God, we see it. God is a God of judgment. We, 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 we think, you know, not everybody is loved by God. You know, it depends on this and this and that. And then other people are, are kind of closet universalist. And we say, in the end, we go, you know what? No, I think he's so loving. I think in the end, I, every, I think everybody is kind of going to find their way. I think you could play it out this way. Is it moralism or is it relativism? Is it law or is it love? Is it truth or grace? Is it conditional or is it unconditional? These are two seeming irreconcilable uh, truths that we see in Scripture. And wherever you land, don't, don't think that the Old Testament in particular resolves this tension. We often in, enter into binaries and into extremes. We see it in our day especially. Contrasts and, and you know, this up against that. There's a real tension here. So let's press on. Let's try to resolve it. Number three, the power of the covenant. All right, we're going to bring it kind of like a funnel. We're going to draw this thing in. Look at what he says. And I will give you rest. Okay, circle that word. I'll give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Watch this. Dave, you want to make me a house? I'm going to make you a house. All right. But he means now dynasty. He's talking about the house of David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, okay, so when you die and are buried, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. This is going to be your boy, okay? This is going to be from your seed, right? This is going to be from your family. This is your house. This is your lineage, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, watch this. We see this often. There's some dual meaning here. He shall build a house for my name. So Solomon will do so. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Here he's pointing to Christ. David, I'm going to build a house. I'm going to make you a house. Here's the power of the covenant. God intervenes. Now, watch this. Um, in Genesis 15, this is so cool. All right, you're, you're hanging with me. In Genesis 12, we see the Abrahamic covenant. And in Genesis 15, here's what happens. Abraham... Uh, gets a word from the Lord, and the Lord tells him this. He says, I want you to take three animals, and a, couple, and a turtle dove and another bird, and um, I want you to take the animals, a uh, heifer, we got a goat, and then a ram, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to cut them up. You're going to sacrifice those animals, all three of them. And I want you to lay the, the pieces, okay, okay, just imagine this, kind of gruesome, lay the pieces of the animals on either side across from each other as if, you know, kind of making a, a way that you could walk through, okay? So there's, there's sacrifices on either side, and then here's what happens. And it even says, and then and he, doesn't, he doesn't cut up the, the other the birds, and he's, he's keeping all the birds away. They're trying to come after the meat and such. And then he falls asleep. Abram his name at that point, Abram falls asleep. And then he has a vision. And in the vision, and God set all this up. In the vision, God himself comes and walks through the, the pieces sacrificed before him. Now watch this. 
When you laid out the sacrifices, you're saying this. Here's what the sacrifice was about. If I, I'm, I'm, keep, I'm making a covenant now with God. And, and I'm making a sacrifice here. And I'm going to walk through this sacrifice. And if I do not keep my side of the covenant, let me become like these animals. Let me be cut up. Let me be destroyed if I don't keep my end of the bargain. That's what the covenant was. That's what a sacrifice is. Let me be like this. And in the, watch, see how radical this is. In the dream, God is the one who steps into that space. He walks through, and he's the one who is now saying, how crazy is this? The God of the universe steps in, and he says, let this be like me. If I don't keep my covenant with you, let me become like these cut up animals, these sacrificed animals. God does this. Abraham wakes up mind blown, right? And God is saying, let the curse come on me if I don't keep this covenant. And so what in the world is going on here? God is saying, I'm going to bless you no matter what. So now fast forward as we start to land this uh, in, the, in the New Testament. In Hebrews 8, it says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant, right? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the divided kingdom, this is David's uh, kingdom, the house of Judah, the house of David, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, for they did not continue in my covenant, so I showed them no concern. He said, I, just, I just wrote them off, all right? And so, so you see the tension here still. Law and love, truth and grace, his holiness and our sin. What is God going to do? How will he resolve this paradoxical tension? And this is where, of course, we get to the fourth point, the person of the covenant. Now look at verse 14 and 16. Oh, I love this. Watch how this lands. And we're going we're to get to celebrate before we head off into Memorial Day weekend. Celebrate this truth together. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, now here's where it goes, wait, 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 whoa, what's he talking about here? Well, now he's back to Solomon. Some say, no, 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 this is the iniquity of men, and I'm going to discipline uh, my own son because of the sins of others. I, I think, again, there's dual meaning. It says, I will discipline him with, with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love, steadfast love, covenantal love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away. Okay, I, I took it from him, but I will not take it from your son, my son. Watch this. And your house, David, and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Forever. The house of David will continue on. So what will God do to resolve this unending paradox? No one keeps their side of the covenant. Are you tracking with me? The Bible says, in fact, in Romans, uh, in, in Romans 3, it says that, that uh, nobody is righteous, not one. So look at how Paul unpacks this, and then we'll land it, and then we'll celebrate for a moment. All right, Romans 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. But now, everybody say, but now. But now, now, right now, the righteousness of God has been ma manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So all of this redemptive history pointing to the covenants, pointing to uh, this righteousness that was to come. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody is good enough. Nobody is righteous. Not one. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation, a penalty, a wrath satisfier. Jesus comes and he becomes then the, the punishment, the terms that we could not keep on our side of the covenant. He steps over here. He becomes then the wrath satisfier by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, okay, his patience and his love, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that 
he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Watch this. This is why this is so important. God remains the just and the justifier. He sets the terms and the penalties. He's the one who establishes the covenant, and he's the one who keeps the covenant. He makes the covenant, then he steps over onto our side of the covenant where we could not. There's no way we could live up to the covenant. We've broken the covenant, and he now inserts himself. Jesus comes. And he sacrifices himself. He's the one who's split. He's the one who's cut up and, and broken and dies on the cross for our sin. He accepts the penalty of the covenant that we could not keep. And he's the one then who's cut and divided on our behalf so that we might be able to walk through, through this covenant. Not because we've kept it, but because Christ has kept it for us. He's our substitute. He's the one who's made this possible. He's torn to pieces and on the cross... God's covenant keeping love means that his wrath is taken out on his son. The penalties come upon his son, not on us who could not keep the covenant. And his love, watch this, law and grace, truth and love, grace collide on the cross. His eternal love and his wrath towards sin collide on the person of Jesus and our salvation is made possible by his grace. Praise be to God. Amen? I mean, that's shouting time is what that is. We praise him for it. He's made it possible. This is why the writer of Hebrews says Jesus has become the better mediator. He's the better one. In fact, he sums it up this way. I love this. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. He's the one. He's the guarantee. And we enter into this covenant by faith, not works. Praise be to God. And, and, and what I want to do now is to close our time in prayer, and we're going to sing a song together, okay? Before we go, don't rush out, Memorial Day, whatever you got today. I want us to pause and to praise Him for this great news that He has brought to us. But not everybody in here has received His grace. So for those of us who land on the side to say, well, it's, it's unconditional, His love's unconditional. And then others of us say, no, 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 it's conditional. Watch this, Here, here's what hit me this week. God's love for us is conditional. God loves us because Christ has met the conditions. So yes, his love comes to us without conditions. But don't miss that. People say, well, God's just going to save me because he loves me. No, no, no. He's going to save you because Christ has died on the cross on your behalf. And that is worth praising Him for. And that's worth giving your life to. If you've never received Christ, maybe now for the first time in your life you understand what the cross is all about and why you could not save yourself. The covenant keeper has come. So I want us to pray together. Would you do that? Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes and we're going to pray. And then we're going to sing a song together as we close out this worship service and head into the day. And friend, it's now time for you. You've heard me talking for a while. It's time for you to do business with God and for you to say some things to Him. You're going to have opportunity to say some things to Him in a song that we think lands this message. But, but what do you need to say to Him now? If you never received His grace, if you never fully understood the conditions that must be met for you to have a relationship with God, you understand now. Jesus has met all the conditions that you could not meet. And so by faith, not by works, by faith, you receive what he's done for you. You believe. Do you believe? Say, yes, Lord, I believe. If you believe, if you've never received his grace, let today be the day. On a weekend, we remember those who've given the ultimate sacrifice. We realize Jesus has given the greatest sacrifice of all. The perfect one has died in your place. He met the terms and conditions of the covenant with the Holy God. So Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you have rescued us from our sin. Love found a way and we praise you for that. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, 
please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.